Hi. So I'm going to read Begging for Change by Sharon Flank, chapters 9 through 16. Chapter 9. Sado and I don't go straight home. We head for Odd Job's place. The barbecue wings cooking on the grill make Sado smack his lips. He wants me to get Odd Job to hook him up with some water ice and chicken. I look at him like he's crazy. Yeah, just like you did me that favor on the bus and gave me your seat, I say. Ah, girl, Sado says, showing off them pretty white teeth. I was just trying to treat you like we equals, not baby you like you was a girl or something. Odd job ain't no regular store. He got his whole operation set up on his street corner. He ain't selling frozen Kool-Aid out of cooler like he did last spring. Now he got a water ice stand with a big orange umbrella attached to it. And besides washing cars, he got his boys working off working the grill. A big rusty trash can he split in half and put high up on sticks. Please, Sato says, getting up in my face. I'm making it so I can't think straight. I would do it for you, he says, still trying to get me to hook him up with food. Odd job scraping and scooping up balls of lime green water, lime green water ice, and putting them into cups. Raspberry girl, how's mama? I called her a few times. Would have come visit her in the hospital too, but I don't do stuff like that, he says, handing the water ice to me and Sado. I don't like green all that much, Sado says, eating it anyway. Odd job wipes sweat from his forehead with a ripped up shirt he pulled out his back pocket. It's free, ain't it? He turns my way. Hospitals, hospitals ain't my thing. I break into a cold sweat every time I go inside one, he says. I couldn't even go when my mother was dying. My brothers and sisters still mad at me for that. Sato goes and sits down in Odd Job's lounge chair, pulls back the stick and crosses his leg, like he's sitting on his own living room. Get your crusty butt out my chair, Odd Job yells. Sado stays put. Odd job, don't tell him again to get moving. He asks me some more about Mama. Says he told her not to worry about the rent. Odd job, Dr. Mitchell and Mama grew up in the projects together. He looks out for us. When we have to leave the PJs, when we had to leave the PJs and couldn't get Section 8 house we wanted, he let us move into one of his apartment buildings. He don't charge us hardly nothing. He says Mama can make up the difference by cleaning up the two vacant units in the building. They nasty, though. Mama ain't had the nerve to go at them yet. Mama's doing okay. Your daddy been by? I get mad when he asks that. He don't know where we live. Odd job tells me to chill, not to get all excited. If he show up, y'all call me. I'll take care of things. I don't ask what that means. I just nod my head yes. Then he pulls out $25 and says for me to give it to Mama. Sure, I say, smelling the money before I stuff it in my pocket. Sado walks over to us with lime green lips and teeth. Can you hook a brother up with another water ice? Odd job looks at him like he lost his mind, but he don't say nothing. Because there's cars pulling up. There's three cars pulling up at once. Five little girls get out of the first car. The oldest one looks only six years old. Two of them start whining to their dad about wanting some chicken. A little help here, please, Ajab says, looking our way. I ask the girls what they want. They all start talking at once. I tell them to shut up. Sado says that he can tell I ain't used to being around little kids. He has five brothers and two sisters. He's the oldest. Sado leans down and picks up the smallest one. She's maybe three years old. You want something to drink, too? He says, tickling her belly. She wraps her arms around his neck, whispers something in his ear, then starts playing with his earring. I wait on the second car, and Odd Job takes care of the people who come out the third one. Everybody wants their stuff now. Nobody got exact change. A few of the grown-ups are complaining about the prices and trying to swing a deal with Odd Job. They waste in their breath. Odd Job don't change his prices for nobody, except maybe me and Mama. Before we know anything, everybody is gone. Odd job turns to Sato and asks what flavor ice he wants. He gives him a giant size piled up high with the rainbow color kind. I have to ask him for a refill. He's got his arm around Sato's neck's neck, telling him that he likes how he handles kids. Next thing I know, he's asking him if he wants a summer job. 
Sato looks all happy. He says his mother told him he better find himself a job. Odd job gets his boys to bring over two sizzling hot chicken sandwiches. He hands me one and asks why I'm so quiet. I'm just thinking. That's all. How nice it's going to be working with Sato all summer. Odd job's pinching my nose. Raspberry swirl, what you grinning at, girl? Nothing, I say, licking my lips. Glad they ain't too dry or ashy. Nothing, Sato says, repeating after me, then winking like he's thinking the same thing. Chapter 10. Mama's sitting in the kitchen with her wig hanging from her hand and her head down on the table. She don't answer when I ask how she's doing. I drop my backpack, run over and ask what's wrong. She lifts her head and says she's fine. Just got another headache is all, but her eyes are red, puffy too. Fat, juicy sausages lie in a plate on top of the stove. Stove, Thick, white, sticky water oozes from under a boiling pot of covered rice. My words come out fast. You sick? Need some aspirin? Clean your room, Mama says. Zora and her dad will be here soon. My tongue feels as thick as the sausages. You sure you okay? I ask in a voice as soft as butter melting beside the stove. Mama takes the top off the rice. Wait a minute, I feel like I missed a page. Nope. I ask in a voice as soft as the butter melting beside the stove. Mama takes the top off the rice and sprinkles a, pinkles a pinch of sugar in it. He found us. Rice water bubbles up and runs over the sides of the pot. The fire jumps and sizzles. I know who he is. Mama don't even have to say his name. I opened the door and there he was. I push my fingernails deep into my arm. Oh, how come he can't just leave us alone? Mama cuts the fire off, comes over and holds me close. Your father used to be somebody, she says, clearing her throat. When he walked down the street with that red hair and pretty smile, people stared, wondered who that good-looking man was. I push her away, run to my room and get my stash from under the faded blue linoleum rug. Quarters drop on the kitchen floor when I run back in there asking Mama if Daddy tried to get the money off her. She bends down and picks up the change. Yeah, money. Always money. I follow her into the dining room, sit down at the table and spread my money out. Mama didn't give him a dime. That's what she tells me. She packed him seven sandwiches in a jar of Kool-Aid. Handed him some soap and a washcloth and told him he could wash up at the ho at, with the hose in the backyard. He's just like Shakita, I say. He ain't going to let us live in peace. Mama reaches for my face. You look just like him. I turn away, ask her not to say stuff like that. Don't you remember the silly songs he made up? Him riding you on his back up and down the street? I cover my ears to keep her words out my head, but I'm thinking about stuff too. Like the time he picked me up early from school and took me to the zoo to feed the bears and eat blueberry cotton candy and taffy apples. I gave him sticky kisses. He ain't wash them off all day long. I pick up two pennies. I dropped. I'm not like him, am I? Mama's eyes move all over my face. No, not all that much, she says, walking into the living room. She picks up magazines and stacks them in a neat pile on the glass coffee table she hauled in from somebody else's trash. I lay on the couch, turn over on my stomach, and reach for the piece of purple stationery lying on the floor. Dear Shakita, when I was your age, I went to school. I worked two jobs. I didn't beat people up. My head hurts a lot now, and I'm trying not to hate you, but... I drop the letter when Mama sits down on the couch. I ask her why she's writing Shakita all the time. It's private. That's all she says, like, ain't, like I ain't got the right to know. Then she takes the letter and walks out the room. I pick pillows off the couch, knock the magazines back on the floor. You should hate her for what she done. When she comes back, she hands me a glass of apple juice, steps over the magazine, sits down, and tells me that it helped her seeing Daddy today. Made me see how good we got it, you and me. I look around the place, check out the chipped yellow paint around the windows and the brown spots on the ceiling from where the roof leaked before we moved in. It ain't much, she says, smiling, but it's clean and it's ours, for now anyhow. And we not, we're not, going to let anybody, not your daddy or Shakita, chase us off. Not no more. 
Tears roll down my cheeks. They never gonna leave us alone. And I get so mad about it that sometimes I could just... Mama's fingers is up to her lips. Shh, sniff. She wipes the tears away. What, something stink? Close your eyes and smell. I shut my eyes and breathe it in. Something sweet and pretty fills my nose. Flowers, she says. Our flowers, she says, closing my eyes when I open them. Leaning my, he leaning my head on her shoulder like I'm a baby. We can make something sweet and good out of all the mess around us, if we want. I sniff again. I ask Mama if that's the lilac bush I smell or the roses we planted out back the other day. Mama says she ain't sure that we could go out back and see, but neither, as a, neither one of us moves. We sit for another half hour, holding each other. I got my eyes closed, but my mind won't keep still. I'm trying to figure out how come Mama's writing letters to Shakita and what my father is really up to. I don't so say none of this to Mama. I can see from the letters she's more upset than she's letting on. Maybe scared, too, of what she might do if she don't act like everything is just fine and dandy. Chapter 11. Dr. Mitchell and Zora don't want to come to dinner. Do sorry, Dr. Mitchell said Zora didn't want to come to dinner. She had a headache and stayed home with the housekeeper. I think she just said that, he says, hissing, kissing Mama when he comes in the house. But I didn't argue. Mama's wig is back on her head and her eyes are clear since she put drops in them. Is Zora mad at us or something? She asked Dr. Mitchell. The last two times you came over, she wasn't with you. Dr. Mitchell looks at me. You two fighting? Not me, I say, washing my hands at the kitchen sink. Mama is over by the fridge with Dr. Mitchell, handing him lettuce and cucumbers to watch, wash, telling me to call Zora and at least say hi. I give her this fake smile, say I'll do it later. Now, she says, handing me the dish towel. Dinner's going to be, dinner's still going to be a while. Dr. Mitchell wants us to straighten things out. Your mother and I aren't going to stop seeing each other just because you two aren't getting along. I tell them that maybe Zora's scared to come over because of what happened the last time she was here. Her dad says that ain't it. It's something between you and her. I know it, but she's not saying. You neither, I see. They looking at me like I'm lying. Mama hands me the phone and says, call her. I want to tell them you can't make people be friends. They got to want to. When I dial the phone and start walking to my bedroom, my hand begins to shake. Talk to her out here, Mama says. Dr. Mitchell rips the lettuce in two and tells Mama to stop being so nosy. Let him work it out. Zora, I say when she picks up the phone, what do you want? I want to hang up the phone. I don't. <clears throat> Your dad said for me to call. What? I go outside and sit on the front steps. Till I see Mama by the window, trying to listen in. Then I come back inside and go to my room. They want us to make up. Zora's quiet for a while. Who? She knows who I'm talking about. She's just trying to be smart. I tell her that, too. She hangs up the phone. I call her right back. You stole my money, she says, not even asking who's on the phone first. I lie. Tell her that it wasn't me. Maybe you just lost it or something. I'm waiting for her to hang up again or call me a liar. She asks to talk to her dad. I go to my bedroom door, look at Dr. Mitchell in front of the TV watching baseball and cutting up tomatoes. Why, I ask. Just put him on. I know I should give Zora back her money, but I'm not gonna. Anyhow, she don't need it. She got everything. Too much, really. And all I got is mama. So I lay the phone on the bed and don't pick it up for 15 minutes. Zora's gone by then. When I hang up the phone in the kitchen, Mama asks how things are between me and Zora. You two friends again? Yeah, I say, heading outside to be with Dr. Mitchell. His car alarm went off, and he went to check on things. Dr. Mitchell's on the steps, looking at Miracle and some boys sitting in front of their place. He thinks they messed up with his ride. They, blah. He thinks they messed with his ride and made the alarm go off. He says he don't want no trouble out of them every time he comes to visit. Otherwise, I might have to use my bat again, he laughs. He just came from the barber shop, so you can smell the lotion. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, he just came from the barbershop so you can smell the lotion on his head. It's sweeter than Mama's flowers. Mama's at the window. She wants us to come inside and wash up before we eat. We stay put. Dr. Mitchell's telling me about the time he lived in the PJs and got chased home by some boys who wanted his new sneakers. He's moving his arms and legs like he's running. I only had those sneakers eight hours before they stole them right off my feet. Mama keeps bugging us, saying the food's going to get cold. Dr. Mitchell stands up to go inside, then backtrack, backtracks and goes down the steps. He wipes dried mud off Mama's new escort. It's got 100,000 miles on it, but it's better than what we had. You coming? He asks, walking back up the steps. I'm right behind him, thinking he smells just like my father did after he came from the barbershop on Saturdays. I reach for his hand. He holds tight to mine, and I pretend he's my real dad, and he ain't never going to leave me. We go to the kitchen to wash our hands, all three of us. Dr. Mitchell leans over and kisses Mama right where Shakita hit her. You look good to me, he says, giving her a pinch. Eat up, Mama says, passing the rice. I take two big spoonfuls, then hand the bowl to Dr. Mitchell. And I don't feel one bit, feel bad one little bit that Zora ain't here with us. Chapter 12. Shakita ain't going to jail. The judge gave her six months in juvie and a year of community service. Shakita got a bad attitude, so he wants he wants to put her away to teach her a lesson. Be glad you're not headed to jail, young lady, the judge says. When you hit this woman in the head, you committed assault and battery. That ain't fair, I say so loud, even the judge hears me. She should go to real jail. The judge says for me to quiet down or get out. Mama asks to speak. The judge is real nice to her, tells her to take her time. Shakita's whole family is there, dressed in suits and fancy dresses like they go in a church. Miracle is over there too, rolling her eyes every chance she gets. Rolling her eyes at me every chance she gets. Well, Your Honor, Mama says, rubbing her hands and squeezing her fingers while she talks. Shakita ain't a bad girl. I mean, she isn't a bad girl. She just doesn't have any guidance. A woman in peach pantsuit jumps up and says, that ain't so. Shakita got plenty folks looking out for her, but she hard-headed, wants to do what she wants to do. The judge gives the, hits the gavel on the desk. Quiet. Mama clears her spot, throat, touches the spot where Shakita hit her in the head. Shakita's not bad, Your Honor, but how does 17-year-old, how does, how does 17-year-old get to live all by herself? Where's she getting the money? Nobody's answered that question yet. The judge looks over at Shakita's lawyer. He stands up and says Shakita wouldn't obey her mother's rules, so she put her out. Shakita worked two jobs, Your Honor, at McDonald's in a laundromat near her apartment. The judge looks over at Shakita's mother, asks her if she can handle Shakita when she's released from juvie. She can stay as long as she don't act up, like before, her mother says, crossing her legs. If she d disobeys my rules, she gone. Mama keeps talking, saying Shakita needs to go someplace else once she gets out of juvie, where she can learn to read better and get her GED. I can read, Shakita snaps, so mind your own business. The judge, the judge slams the gavel down again. You, he says, pointing to Shakita. You do your six months in community service, and when I, then I want you back here for placement in a group home. He points to Shakita's social worker. Have something in place. Don't come back here with your, with your hands empty. Mama sits down next to me, holds my hands and says, maybe she's going to have a chance now. <sighs> I don't know. I think Mama just made things worse. Shakita's looking back at us and saying something we can't hear. Miracle's shaking her head like she can't believe what just happened. When we get outside, Mama asks me if I want to go for ice cream. I just want to get away from here. Shakita's people are right behind us. I don't want them starting nothing. Hey, you, wait up. It's Shakita's mother. She got on shoes so tall and pointy, it looks like she could stab you with the heel or the toe. What's your name again? She says, lighting up a cigarette right in Mama's face. Mrs. Hill, Mama says, fanning smoke away. Well, Ms. Hill, my daughter was raised just right. I sent her to school with all my other kids. They graduated, working now too. But Shakita, she got a hard head. So naturally, 
So naturally, hard times going to follow somebody like that. Mama is not as tall as this woman, and even though Mama's dressed real nice, her clothes look like rags next to hers. I wasn't trying to say you didn't raise Shakita right. Yes, you did, one of Shakita's sisters says. I heard you say it right in there. And you wrong, too, she says, playing with three little gold bracelets she's wearing. Mama starts to walk away, then stops. She tells Shakita's mother that Shakita's only a child, and she don't need to have her own place and be paying her own way. She needs somebody to look after her, to make sure she goes to school and does the right thing. The woman moves closer to Mama. People like you get on my last nerve, she says, thinking you can do better, acting like you better. <clears throat> I tell Mama to come on and let's go. But before we do, Miracle walks over and gives us her, gives us her two cents. She liked to play rich, she says, pointing to Mama, planting all them flowers, sweeping up all the time, and minding other folks' business. <clears throat> Shakita's mother steps in front of Miracle and tells her to go someplace else. You think you can do better by Shakita, she says, holding a finger in Mama's face. The one with a big diamond ring on it. Take her. Let her come live with you once she does her time. Then we'll see how much you know about raising kids. <clears throat> I don't move, not even to look at Mama's, not even to look Mama's way, because I'm so scared she's going to say, okay, when Shakita gets out, she can come live with us. Well, Mama says, taking her time talking, if I had the room, Shakita's mom throws down her lit cigarette and stomps it. See, y'all kind always talking, but never do step up to the plate when the time comes. Mama turns around and heads down the steps, stops walks back up to Shakita's mom and says, she's your child. Raise her like I raised mine. And don't be expecting me to do your job. Miracle's mouth is hanging open. Shakita's sister look like they want to smack me and mama. Her mother stands there saying that mama ain't nothing but talk. We take off down the steps. They following us, mama says, pulling me by the hand. I look back. No, they still stand in there. Good, she says, walking faster. Let's hurry up before they do. Chapter 13. Mama and me went out to eat, so it was late when we got home from the trial. Miracle was sitting on our steps by then. We had to ask her to give us room so we could get into our own place. I was mad. Mama, too. But she ain't want to start no trouble, so we went inside and stayed there. By the time it was dark, our steps were almost full. Miracle and her friends was there, acting up, celebrating because Shakita got off light, not having to go to county jail. The noise was so bad, we couldn't hear the TV unless we turned it up full blast. I'm calling the cops, Mama says. I beg her not to. You do that and somebody gonna get her. somebody going to hurt you again. Maybe worse this time. One o'clock in the morning, we smell weed. Miracle's still out front, mouthing off, drinking wine straight out a bottle and saying they should take all Mama's stupid flowers and throw them into the street, then bust up that junk pop car she bought. Mama can't sleep. Me neither. So one minute she's in the kitchen looking for something good to eat. Next minute she's cleaning. She's already done all the woodwork and cleaned out the stove. I tell her we need to just go to bed, but that won't make no sense because we're not going to be able to sleep no how. Come two o'clock in the morning, I tell Mom, Mama she should call Dr. Mitchell or Odd Job. No, you want them hurt? These kids just looking for trouble tonight. Anybody that comes by here is going to find it, too. I sit by the window and peek out under my curtain. Miracle's sitting on our car. Some boy is holding her around the waist, kissing her hard. Her girlfriend is asking her if she's got a light. A cigarette lighter flies from her hands over the steps. We should burn the whole place down. The whole street, Miracle says, pushing the boy away, walking up our steps and sitting down. Mama tells me to get away from the window. Shakita's my girl. We like this, Miracle says, crossing her fingers. That witch, she says, pointing to our house, act like she owns the neighborhood and everybody got to do things her way. The wine's getting to Miracle, I guess. Because all of a sudden she starts to cry. Shakita and me like sisters. She don't make me pay rent. Just cook and clean. Now I'm going to get kicked out unless money start coming in. Miracles girls tell her to stop acting like a punk. Then somebody reminds her that landlords can't throw you out even when you don't pay up. 
not for six or eight months at least. Mama sits down on the floor by me and looks out the window too. We hold our breath when Miracle walks up to the door and kicks it. Y'all come out here, now! Mama's eyes get big. It's Miracle's fist on the door now. Bam, bam, bam. I'm calling the police, Mama says, heading for the kitchen on her hands and knees. I'm right behind her, crawling like a baby, telling her the police will come, but Miracle won't go nowhere. She's still going to be living up the street tomorrow. We go back to the window, peek out under the blinds. Y'all crazy over there making all that noise. It's Miss Evelyn, Mama's friend from across the street. She got a phone in her hand. I'm calling the police. Don't think I'm playing. Miracle backs off. We just having a little fun. Dag. She sits down on the top steps again. Why don't you go to your own building? Leave that nice woman alone. One of Miracle's friends cusses, tells Miracle she's bored anyhow and they need to get going. Miss Evelyn slams the door shut. Me and Mama don't move. At three, it's three o'clock in the morning and Mama's still sitting at the window. She's asleep. Her arms are holding her legs and her head. Her arms are holding her legs and her head's leaning against the windowsill. Every once in a while, I gotta push her up straight so she don't fall over. Now Miracle's friends are joking around with her about being homeless. You gonna be living in a shelter? Well, I well don't worry, boo. We'll come over and visit you, one of them kids says. I can't see Miracle living in a shelter or on the street. She's too cute for that. I'm going to bed, Mama says. I stay at the window till Miracle's gone an hour later. Then I go to Mama's room to cut off the light. She's asleep. There's a pen in her hand and a balled up stationery all over the floor. Crossed out says, Dear Shakita, I don't like you. I don't like your friend Miracle. I try to live a decent life and all you do is make things dirty and loud. I'm tired of the both of you. But then not crossed out, it says, Dear Shakita, your friend scared us tonight. But we're still here. Nobody can make us leave before we're ready. You are smart. I know we used to talk a lot. But you need different friends if you want a different kind of life once you get out. Remember, you deserve better. I want to wake Mama up and tell her to cross off the sweet stuff she wrote and rewrite the part that says she don't like Shakita or Miracle. I want her to not be nice to them. To take a stick and hit them good. To make Shakita's mom cry at night, like I do sometimes, thinking about what happened and what could have happened to me if Mama had died or something. Mama wakes up, rubs her eyes, and asks what I'm doing in her room. I'm holding the letter behind my back, telling her I just came in to kiss her goodnight. I love you, she says, pulling me into the bed with her. I love you too, I say. I drop the letter to the floor. Mama's so close and warm. Raspberry, she says, yawning. Yeah, Mama. One day, things will settle down for us. All this craziness will be over. You wait and see. I tickle her. She tickles me back. I know, Mama, I say, laughing, not hardly paying no mind to the sirens screaming as a fire truck races up our street. Uh-oh. Chapter 14. Since the trial and Miracle's party, Mama's changed her mind about a few things. First off, she want to move. Now, not just because Daddy knows where we live or because she's tired of dealing with Shakita and Miracle. Just because I want you safe and not filled with worry all the time, she says. So Mama talked to the lawyer again, told her she wants us in that Section 8 house in Pecan Landings before school starts up in September. It's June 3rd now. Don't know what's going to happen with the new house, or Miracle, or my father neither. All I know is, nobody can't nobody take care of me and Mama, but me and Mama. So when Mama leaves the house to go to her job pressing clothes at the dry cleaners, I hit the streets. Knock at every door on our block, all 25 of them. People around here sleep late on Saturdays, so some folks never do answer the door when I show up wanting to know if they'll pay me to sweep or hose down their sidewalks. Other folks just hang their heads out the window and call me every name they can think of. But six people, mostly old, dried-up women, say for me to go ahead. I make $30 in two hours. Where'd I go? Not as much as I want, so instead of going to Mai's house and heading for the mall like I planned, I knock on one more door. I ask the man who answers if he wants his pavement done. 
What? He says, coughing and hacking, spitting yellow snot onto the pavement. My name is Raspberry Hill, I say, repeating myself again. I live up the block. For $10, I'll clean your walk. Wash it down, scrub it clean, you know. This man ain't old like the women. He's like 30. Got a black do-rag tied round his head and a big gold loopy earring on. Gid big gold hoop earrings on. I oughta, he says, making a face so mean I take a step back. Girl, I just got to bed. And you out here hustling, waking me up for some stupid stuff. If you don't get... I'm down his crooked steps and two houses over before he slams his door shut. Forget you, I yell, crossing the street and knocking on Miss Evelyn's door. Your mama wants something, she says, holding her hand over her eyes to block the sun. I shake my head no. Say, I just wondering, I was just wondering if she needed any help doing stuff around her place. Ain't you nice, she says, grabbing my cheek and pinching it, just like your mother. When Miss Evelyn walks, one, legs go, one leg goes high up in the air, then down again, like she's trying not to step on poop or something. She's pretty for somebody her age. Got long, silver-blue hair past her shoulders. Big, fat teeth. Fake ones, probably. Her skin is the color of pecan shells. I was thinking just the other day, she says, taking me round back to the yard. Somebody needs to clean this here alley. She holds her nose and unlocks the gray wooden fence, with faded red apples painted all over it. Garbage is everywhere. Like somebody threw trash bags out the windows just to see how far the food would fly when the bags smashed to the ground like water balloons. It's a shame, isn't it? Miss Evelyn says, taking my hand. The junkies be back here sometimes, you know, sleeping in all this filth. I think about daddy. I wonder if he hanging out in places like this. Your mother sends you, she asks bending down and picking up a rusty corn can. Because she said she would, you know. I stopped following her because it's too nasty out here. No, I say, checking the bottom of my sneakers. Poor thing, must have forgot. She said she was going to send you by a few weeks ago to help me spray flowers. Bugs like the roses, you know. I tell Miss Evelyn that I was just out trying to make some money. Wanted to know if she needed some needed help with something. But I can't clean up the alley. You need a bunch of people to do that. She uses her skirt for a trash bag, holds up the bottom and drops old can and pieces of paper in it. I do what I can. I let her know that I can't stay for long as I got stuff to do. She keeps walking up the alley saying she's seen the alley behind our house, how clean it is. That's because mama's been doing it since we moved there last year. Even made Dr. Mitchell an odd job come help one weekend. It's easier to keep it clean once you get it good and clean, she says. Well, I gotta go, I say, telling her she needs to go inside too, because it ain't safe back here. Miss Evelyn doesn't follow me. She says for me to let myself out and to take a few quarters out the candy dish in the hallway, because your family been so nice to me. She got a whole bunch of quarters too. So many that they running over the sides of the dish and piling up on the table and floor. I stand there a while, counting them in my head, and I stop at 25 bucks. But there's way more than that. I pick up about $20 worth and walk out the door, jingling the change in my pocket like I ain't got a care in the world. Chapter 15. I'm almost done, pup. Chapter 15. Sato called. It's the first time that boy ever picked up the phone and dialed my number. I am so happy. Mom is working out back in the garden. We haven't seen Miracle for two whole weeks, and things are going pretty good. So him calling makes this the week makes this week extra special. I was thinking about you, he says, and I didn't have nothing else to do, so I called. Good. Sato says he's on his front porch watching two little girls jump in double dutch. I walk outside, look up and down the street for Miracle. She ain't there. You get your money back from the class trip, he asks. Yeah, I say. Not enough people signed up for the trip, so they canceled it. I gave doctors, Dr. Mitchell's money to Zora so she would know I'm not a thief. Sato covers the phone and talks to somebody else for a minute. I wasn't going no how. Here. He hands the phone to somebody. It's a boy. A little one. His brother, I guess. He's so small. All he says on the phone is, Hi! Hi! That's my baby brother. He's three. A twin. I walk over to the Snapdragons and 
pull three out the dirt, hold them under my nose and smile at how sweet they are. Sato asks about Mama, how she's doing. I tell him about the letters. I wouldn't write to somebody that smashed me in the head, he says. I walk down the steps and over to the back fence. Mama's carrying a big plant with its roots hanging out like thin white veins. I don't think she mails them. Sato says, that's worse. To write letter you know when you ain't sending? Send What's she writing them for? I both go back to my seat and look at Miss Evelyn waving at me. I turn around and go inside. They should have let us go on that class trip. I wanted to go someplace different, not be around here all the time. Turns out Sato didn't have enough money to go. He says he was going to have a party all by himself when we took off for Canada. I already started stashing things. Chips, cookies, pop. I ask Sato how it feels to have other people in the house besides grown-ups. To not be the only child. He says it ain't bad, but he's the oldest, so he feels like the only, he's the only one sometimes. My ten-year-old brother shares a room with me. He's too young for me to talk to about guy stuff. But if my mom gets on my nerves or my dad has gone too long, me and him talk about that. Usually I talk to my girls about everything, but since I took Zora's money, I don't feel right calling Janae and Mai up or telling them I'm scared something else bad is going to happen to Mama and me. They might ask me about the money, and I don't want to talk about that. When I'm grown, I'm going to have two kids, a boy and a girl, Sato says. I'm having six. And I'm going to live in a big house with four bathrooms, eight fireplaces, a refrigerator so big it'll have four doors on it. I go to my bedroom, lay across my bed, and put my feet up on the wall. My house is going to be all by itself, not attached to the next house like this one, and it's going to be in the woods. In the woods? Don't ask me to come visit. Well, maybe not in the woods, but surrounded by trees. Bad things don't happen to people in houses with lots of trees nearby. Sato says I'm nuts. In the movies, it's the houses in the woods where people end up cut to pieces and... Oh yeah, I forgot. They went to live in the city. Then I want to live in the city, in a house, not connected to another house. I want lots of flowers and lots of children. Shh, just a minute. Lots of children. And a husband, right? Right. And Mama, too. She gotta be there. So he goes back to talking about his house. How his wife ain't gonna work like his mother. She's gonna stay home. What if she don't want to? What if she wants to be a lawyer, like Zora's mom? Or have two jobs, like my mother? Your mother likes working them jobs? I have to think a minute. <laughs> no, but if she had one good job, not two, that don't pay all that well, she'd like that. She would like it, I bet. Sato's mind is made up. His wife's going to stay home and take care of the kids. Not work and cook and clean and care for a million kids like my mom. I tell Sato that I'm going to do both. Work, take time off and have kids, then go back to work when they're 10. Sato says he could be down with something like that, but he ain't sure. I lay on my stomach and quarters fell out my pocket. For a minute, I want to tell Sato everything about the money I stole off Zora and Miss Evelyn. How sometimes I really do wish my father were living here, taking care of us. Mama calls me. She needs help in the garden. I gotta go. Me too, Raspberry Curl. I bite down on my lip. You gonna call me back sometime? Sato's quiet. Sometimes, he says laughing. Sometimes I just might call you again, Raspberry Swirl. I don't hang up when he does, because I can hear him saying my name. Chapter 16 We only got two weeks of school left. And Mai wants to cut class today. She wants to go hang out at Daddy Joe's restaurant and get something good to eat. You coming? She asks me. We standing out front of the school, watching everybody else go in, talking to Ming while Janae's braiding his hair. Y'all going or not? Mai says. Mai asks. Janae ain't going. She's scared her grandfather will find out and she'll really get into trouble. Ming tells Mai she better take her butt to class before you get shipped off to California sooner than you want. We ask him what that's supposed to mean. He says, Mai's got to go live with her father's people for the summer. I make this face like I smell something rank. You going to be living with Koreans? I ask Mai. Just you and all of them? Mai bends down and plucks Ming, plucks Ming upside the head. That hurts. I can tell by how red his face is now. If you wasn't my sister, he says, balling up his fist. Man, you can hit sisters, Sato says, walking over to us and bobbing around like he's in a boxing ring. You just can't hit girls outside your family. 
But sisters, they always got it coming to them. Ming slaps him five, says Mai's getting on their parents' nerves, so she's got to go, he says, ducking. Mai pops him again. Anyhow, he says, looking over his shoulder at us, my father says it'll help her figure out who she is. Mai gives Sato and Ming the finger, then points to her tattoo. This is who I am. Ming shakes his head. She hates Koreans. Hates them, and she's one too. Now, do that make any sense? He stands up, grabs Mai's arm, and presses it to his. You know what, Mai? He says, pushing her away. You ain't 100% nothing, so get over it. Janae tells, Mai to, Janae tells Ming to chill. I tell him to get off Mai's case. I just let her be who she want to be. Ming says I should mind my own business. Then he turns to Mai and says something to her in Korean. Ni ga nuku in jai. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't even read that. Um, I feel disrespectful trying to say that wrong. I don't know what it is, but it makes my cry. Next thing we know, she's across the street, all up in his bo this boy's face. He's new to our school, so quiet, we call him Q. We better go talk to Mai, Janae says, putting Ming's hair in one big braid and telling him she'll finish it later. Ming ain't happy with Janae. He says he ain't thinking about Mai. Wait a minute. Ming ain't happy with Janae. He says, hey, he says, oh, stop. I'm almost done here. Ming ain't happy with Janae. He says he ain't thinking about Mai because she's always mad about something. Janae keeps walking. We all like sisters, she says, so I got to go. I don't want to go over there because Zora just got off the bus. She's headed Mai's way. I stay behind a minute and ask Ming what he said to Mai. He rubs his forehead. I said, if you really knew who you were, you wouldn't have to write it on your arm. Ming walks off, not even saying goodbye. I head for Janae and Zora. Hey, I say to Zora in a tiny little voice. She don't speak to me, but she got a whole lot to say to Janae. She's asking her what's up with Mai. Then Janae, then says Janae needs to talk to Ming and get him to stop being so mean to Mai. It ain't Ming's fault, Janae says. He likes being mixed. He don't know why she don't. Mai puts her hand out for another tissue and asks if we're going to go to Daddy Joe's with her. Zora says we can count her out. Janae puts her arms around me and Zora. So, go. So you, no, wait a minute. Janae puts her arms around me and Zora. Go. So you and Raspberry can make up. I tell Janelle, Janae I ain't mad at Zora. Zora puts her purse over her shoulder, folds her arms, and says that I should go ahead and tell them what I did. <coughs> then they'll know why we're not friends anymore. Mai and Janae look at me like I'm going to tell them the truth. I don't. I tell Zora to tell them. I'm scared, though, because she just might. Only she ain't done it so far, and I don't even know why. Zora shakes her head no. Is it about your dad and her mom, Janae asks, or your real father, Mai says. Zora says she ain't telling, because my telling won't make it any better. I roll some of Miss Evelyn's quarters around in my pocket. I ask Mai if she's still going to Daddy Joe's. Yeah, she says, throwing her tissue in the grass. Maybe we can do something tomorrow, Zora. You, me, and Janae. Zora says she'll ask her dad to take them to the movies. I'm glad, because maybe when he don't see me there, he will drive by our place to ask why. Then Mama and me will get to go spend time with him, to do something special, like drive around for ice cream or go see a movie. The three of them make plans for the weekend. I sit by the curb waiting for Mai. I'm never going to give Zora her money back, I say to myself.